We picked that topic on purpose. Because speaking of elections, that continues to be a key election topic. Even though ISIS and Ebola have kind of uh, uh, taken the, uh, uh, most of the attention here in the last few weeks, health care is a prime election uh, topic. Well, tonight, we are fortunate to have two of the nation's leading experts on health care with us. And uh, uh, Dr. Lee Carisco, raise your hand, and Dave Racer, and they're going to uh, lay out the impact of Obamacare and what it means to our future. Uh, and they do this together. Uh, Dave and, uh, and Lee are friends. They work together uh, on the book. Uh, just take uh, Lee first. Uh, Dr. Lee Crisco is Canadian, he's a radiologist, went to uh, medical school in Canada and worked for a number of years in the uh, Canadian nationalized uh, medical system. And in 2001, I think, uh, Lee, you uh, came to the United States because he wanted to practice medicine in a free market. And then, uh, you started to see uh, signs that the uh, U.S. was uh, was headed towards a uh, socialized uh, or socialized medicine, and Lee uh, wrote a book called Health Reform: End of End of the American Revolution, and he puts a question mark at the end. So I'm going to add a couple of things. Health Reform: Is this the end of the American Revolution? Posing the question with that. So he's going to have great insights here. One of the few people that's practiced in both the socialized uh, medical field and in a free uh, free market. Uh, Dave Racer uh, is uh, uh, an outstanding speaker. He is a prolific author. Just on the subject of healthcare alone, Dave has written or and or edited nine books on U.S. health. He's one of the few Americans really understands the impacts of Obamacare and its attack on the U.S. Constitution. And so, Dave, we're going to get started now. We are ready. Oh, I decided, uh, caught me. I was just getting ready to uh, put my presentation together for you, and I wanted to make sure I understood the new Affordable Care Act. And I was kind of caught in this one section here. I wondered maybe you could help me understand it. It's under um, a section called Increased FMAP for Medical Assistance for Newly Eligible Mandatory Individuals. And I'm down in subparagraph 2A uh, called Newly Eligible. Uh, maybe you could help me understand this. Uh, newly Eligible. The term Newly Eligible means with respect to an individual described in subclause of section 1902A10A1, or is that I, an individual who is not under 19 years of age or such higher age as the state may have elected, and who as of December 1st, 2009, is not eligible under the state plan or under a waiver of the plan for full benefits or for benchmark coverage described in subparagraph A, B, or C, of section 1937B1 or benchmark equivalent coverage described in section 1937B2 that has an aggregate actuarial value that is at least actuarially equivalent to benchmark coverage described in subparagraph A, B, or C of section 1937B1 or is eligible but not enrolled or is on a waiting list for such benefits or coverage through a waiver under the plan that has a capped or limited enrollment that is full. Does that make sense? I'll tell you what's scary, that's only two paragraphs out of that whole bill. And you can imagine how dense the rest of it is. You can imagine how dense the people are who put it together. Wow. So that is uh, Obamacare uh, reduced to nonsense, which it is when you try to read it and understand it and apply it. We're going to try to talk about uh, a lot of issues here tonight. Uh, it's, it's actually impossible 
talk about the healthcare system in an hour. Uh, I used to do three hour talks. And my wife said, you've always got to do three hour talks. And she listened to them over and over and over. And she said, you still didn't get it all covered. Well, we're still going to just condense it tonight. I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time with you on Minsure and what's really going on uh, up there. Uh, I was reminded that I'm in the territory of uh, Tina Liebling. And, um, and I couldn't find the clip. Actually, I found the clip, but I don't have it to show to you. My favorite clip of the debate during uh, Mincher, uh, when they were debating House uh, Bill 5. And she said, you know, when I go into a grocery store, I have to shop for soup. And I walk in, and there's 30 different brands. And I get so confused, sometimes I walk out because there's too many choices. <laughs> and I thought, and you're representing people in the legislature. Uh, but there is a, uh, an indication of someone who doesn't understand that we, the people, have the ability to make decisions, rational decisions. There's a couple of things. This is kind of hard to see. I didn't know it was going to be a smaller screen. But just some things that we need to keep in mind that I think maybe a lot of people forget. We are the third largest country in the world. It's, it's easy to forget that. But with 314 or 320 million people, that's a huge bunch of people that we have to care for. And our people are very culturally diverse. They come from a lot of different backgrounds. They come from a vast variety of cities and towns and states with different cultures. Uh, when you try to create a national health care system in the United States, it's like trying to rule 50 different countries or even more than 50 different countries. It's not like trying to put together a system for Switzerland, which is one country of people who kind of look a lot alike. Uh, we have a country that's very, very different. Medical services are not simple. They require a vast amount of support services, products, devices, and the financing of trillions of dollars, at least in the United States. And calling ours a health system, and some people will say this, we shouldn't call it a system. It's not a system. It's mixed up. It's chaotic. Well, yeah, it is. It is. What the uh, economists call this is a complex system. A complex economic system is extremely, extremely difficult to manage. If you look at all these little blocks flying around here, and you think of that one up there as your internist, your primary care doctor, uh, who is now retired, I don't know what you're doing for a doctor now, but uh, there you have that. And here's the radiologist over here, and he kind of sort of touched, while well, he's out here on his own, they're kind of out there, aren't they, radiologists? And, and down here, you've got a guy who takes a piece of diamond out of a mine in South Africa that becomes part of a drill bit. And, these are, and over here, you have the companies that pay for health care. They all touch this system a little bit. It's extremely com complex. Well, along comes the Affordable Care Act and some brainiacs in Washington, D.C., who say, if we could only organize this system then it would be more efficient and it would meet people's needs. And so they conceive of a system where they can kind of pack everything in together and then run it out of Washington, D.C. But that's insane because it is a complex system. They start with this assumption that we don't really have very good health care. Folks, we have the best health care in the world. And it isn't all just here in Rochester. Minnesota in particular does lead the nation in many, many ways. We really do. We have, we have areas of health care that need help all the time. We have shortfalls. There's no question about that. We also have the greatest health care spending in the world. One of the reasons that we have the greatest health care spending in the world is because we're a wealthy nation. We can afford to spend more money on health care than many other nations. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. But the system is broken. The system as it is has many pieces that need to be reformed, or as I say, redesigned. Healthcare needs to be redesigned. We need new delivery and finance systems. We just don't need the one that they gave us. We need systems that are based on reality at the ground level, not from Washington, D.C., and they must not, must not, must not be politically driven. And I'm going to demonstrate to you tonight in a most candid way how this system is so politically driven. And that is why we are in so much trouble. Healthcare is going to change. In fact, you can't stop healthcare from changing. 
My uh, internist told me one of the reasons that we live so long is because of these wonderful drugs we have now. He says, we keep people alive too long. That's our problem. And then we've got to spend a lot of money on them. Well, I kind of like that. Uh, but you know that uh, I wrote a book. I've got the book over there, the biography of the father of the artificial heart. He invented a uh, fully implantable artificial heart in the early 60s. Unfortunately, uh, greed and avarice and other people's desires got in the way of that uh, final development of that product. But think of that. If someone were to come up with a fully implantable artificial heart that ran on batteries, how astounding would that be? And I can tell you that the devices that are being conceived of today and will be available tomorrow are incredible. Uh, and we, where we head, and how do you manage that? How does someone in Washington, D.C. decide whether or not this new device, this new drug, this new uh, apparatus is the right one that makes sense? The market can do it. The market can do it, but government cannot. Well, Congress gave us this as an answer to how we ought to govern ourselves. And I'm going to show you, and I, I usually have a picture over here, but right there it says patience. Oh, way down here, okay, look under the podium, it's right there. And over here it says physician. Does that tell you a little bit about how healthcare was structured in the Affordable Care Act? We keep the physician and the patient separated by this polyglot of, of organizations, secretariats, divisions, potentates, and others. We know that Kathleen Sebelius was the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I leave her in there because, well, she found out the hard way. Her name, her title, was in that bill over 3,000 times. Over 3,000 times it said the Secretary shall, the Secretary will, at the discretion of the Secretary, and on, and on, and on. And it gave her deadlines. One of the deadlines was by the 30th of June, 2010, she was to release the rules for the health insurance exchanges. It only took two and a half years to get them out. She found out it was really hard to manage a complex economic system from Washington, D.C. It created 159 new boards, commissions, study groups, and grant makers, 1,968 new regulations, over 28,000 pages so far, so far in the implementation of this program. The Wall Street Journal had an article, it was a year ago, last summer now, that said that we spent $1.9 trillion, $1.9 trillion businesses meeting the regulatory demands of government. Now think about that. We spend about $2.8 trillion on healthcare. How much of healthcare spending is driven by over-regulation from Washington, D.C.? and from the states. It is the most regulated eco uh, economic system in the country, and we've added 1,968 more regulations to that mess. We've transferred policy making, if you will, on health care from the states, from the local communities, from the local practices even, to Washington, D.C. We have given them oversight. And on and on, tardy, tardy issuance of regulatory guidelines. We still have regulations for programs that are already launched that haven't been written yet, or they haven't been finalized yet. And you have states trying to implement Obamacare where they don't even know what the rules are, and the rules will change on them. Uh, that is part of uh, what has happened. Now, I was in a debate. Uh, well, I've been in a few debates. This one was up in, uh, during the last campaign and the spokesman for the Minnesota Hospital Association was on the panel. We did this debate three times, and finally got frustrated with me, and I said, I said, uh, you know, I've been saying a lot of things, and he said, David, the ACA wasn't written for us. It was written for Texas, and Florida, and California. And I said, that's my point. <laughs> Why are they writing a new law for Minnesota? I know in Texas that the uninsured rate exceeded 25%. I know the uninsured rate in California exceeded 30%. And Florida had similar problems. They have a large immigrant population. By the way, their uninsured rate for auto insurance is about the same. We didn't nationalize auto insurance, did we? No. But healthcare, we did. So they make this assumption, and this is why I introduced the subject this way, they make the assumption 
that they can manage this complex economic system for this country that is more like 50 countries or 150 countries. And if you count the Iron Range, that's another one. Uh, you know, we're, we're creating a system to try to develop policy as if everybody's the same. And we're not. We're so different. And within our communities, we're different. And might I add, <laughs> I teach the uh, Constitution. I've been blessed to teach for 15 years now a course called American Government for Real. I teach high school age students, homeschool students. I get them 15 weeks in the fall and 15 weeks in the spring. In the last 15 years, I've created a uh, from about, uh, well, from mines full of mush, about 600 white right wing extremists, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, but when I teach them the Constitution, I teach them the doctrine of enumerated powers. Folks, there is no enumerated power in the Constitution for the Affordable Care Act. It doesn't exist. And it's a shame that we can't fight it on that grounds alone. But we have an ignorant population, we have ignorant politicians, and even worse, ignorant judges. So we have to do it differently. So how's that working out right now? We were forced to, you know, not give people the raises that they used to be able to receive. Rates have gotten astronomically high and not providing great benefits for it. And we had better benefits and we were paying less. Now we're paying more for fewer benefits. It's just frustrating. We're starting to hear, uh, finally, employers speaking up. This uh, past week, we had a press conference in St. Paul about the premium increases, not this year, but I'm going to talk about those. But last year, when all small groups in Minnesota experienced premium increases in double digits, some as high as 50 and 60 percent, and they're looking at this fall, and this is another paper I wrote, uh, 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 percent. In one case, from yes, southeastern Minnesota, 135 percent rate increase. I am not kidding you. What happens when an employer is faced with a 135% rate increase? He can't pay it. And he has to blow up his employer group, or he has to force his employees to pay you know, a lot more out of their own pocket for their insurance, or he has to cut back the quality of the health plan. There are very few options. When your rates go up 40%, as hers did, there's very few options. What do you do when they're 135%? How's it working out? Wasn't it supposed to cost less? I'm cool. That's my wife, Carol. Uh, I have four kids. Over $6,500. That's on top of what we're paying. I did some calculations, and with that, now it competes with rent. I don't have to worry about kids lunch because all the kids go to school now and yeah, extra activity fees for school, I mean necessities now, we're going to have to start worrying about that and so it gets pretty stressful. We're not sure what's going to happen. This fall, uh, well last, actually last year, December 1st, a lot of what are called small groups, people that employ fewer than 50 people, that's small groups. A lot of those small groups uh, renewed their health plans December 1st. They did that because they could keep their old insurance and it would keep their rates down. This December 1st, they are going to be forced into what are called ACA compliant health plans. Those health plans, this is what I wrote the paper on, are the ones that are facing 40 to 60 to 80 percent rate increases. What do you think the conversation is going to be this Thanksgiving? When they're sitting down to eat their Thanksgiving pie, they're going to be talking about health insurance. What are we going to do? How are we going to come up with two or three hundred dollars more a month to pay health insurance premium? Now, here is the sad thing about this: even President Obama understood what burden he was creating for these small groups. Last November, 
And again in March, he issued uh, one of his famous illegal unconstitutional executive orders. <laughs> but that one said, when you violate the law this time, uh, Mr. Governor, if you wish, we can waive that requirement to buy that compliant health plan for two more years. So these businesses, December 1st, that face a 40-50% rate increase could have been spared for two more years. For two more years. 39 governors signed the waiver, including Governor Jerry Brown in California, for small groups anyway, he didn't do it for individuals, but not Governor Dayton. Governor Dayton said, well, we have these other groups who have conformed and they'd have to pay six or seven percent more. By the way, I verified that. That's a true number. So instead, the 72,000 employees of these other businesses who took advantage of the law a year ago are now going to be forced to come up somehow with hundreds of dollars a month more in premium that they would not have had to pay if this governor would have simply signed the waiver. We've been calling them out on this since July, by the way. This isn't a new revelation. So let's talk a little bit about Mincher, um, if we can. Now that's Mincher's logo, and it says where you choose health coverage. What about those lowest rates in the nation that they were telling us about? Well, first of all, it is not the place to buy health insurance. It is a place to buy health insurance. They like to make it sound like it's the only place you can go. Mincher is not an insurance company. Mincher is not an insurance plan. Mincher is an insurance distribution system. There are lots of other insurance distribution systems, but it is the only place you could go to get, I was going to say on the government dole, but I didn't want to be cynical. It is the only place you can go to get a government health plan or receive tax credits. So if you want to have the government help you pay for your premiums or get on a government health plan, you got to go there. You can't go into the private marketplace. Prior to Minsure, we already had more than 50,000 insurance agents acting as, if you will, insurance exchanges. Because that's what insurance agents do. They show a number of different products from a number of different countries. Countries, yeah, companies, not countries. Well, maybe they do, maybe there are, no, there isn't. I'm sorry, that was a misspoke. Okay, and, and they do essentially what exchanges do, only they do it the old fashioned way with books and things. And so now there's been a lot of uh, online websites created that are private exchanges. So what Minture is, is a website where people can consider signing up for health insurance or health coverage. And there are scores of these in the private marketplace that all compete with the government exchange. So, what is an exchange? It is a place where you can go and buy health insurance. They tend to be online now because everything's online. And you can go and pick out a health plan from the company called insureeasy.net. First of all, the website actually works. And secondly, you can pick every single health plan that's offered at Venture plus more because it's a private exchange. The only thing is, you can't get enrolled in a government health plan, and you can't get a tax subsidy if you go through a private marketplace. So what does Venture do? It enrolls people in health plans. To date, it has enrolled 350,000 people, roughly, into health plans. They're very, very proud of that number. Of those, 86% are on Medicaid or Minnesota Care. Did you hear what I said? 86% are on Medicaid or Minnesota Care. We are the only state in the nation that has what is called a basic health plan. That's Minnesota Care. No other state has this. So up to 200% of the federal poverty guideline income, you either get free health care on Medicaid or you get reduced premium health care on Minnesota Care. And you get to try to find a doctor who will actually take you because 55% of doctors no longer take Medicaid or do Medicaid patients except when they have a heart and they have to help them because they have a need. But it's not, you know, having coverage doesn't mean you have access to doctors. You gotta understand that. 
86% of the 54,000 who are in commercial health plans through MNsure, about half of them are subsidized. So you can kind of do the numbers, 93 or 94% of the people who are enrolled in a health plan through MNsure are getting taxpayer bailout or taxpayer help to pay their premiums. I'm a little cynical about it, I can, you can tell. Just talking about MNsure, uh, about uh, Medicaid and Minnesota Care, we have added to the state budget, Mr. Legislator, about one and a half billion dollars in additional expense. A lot of that is paid by the federal government for the next couple years. Where do they get the money? I mean, that's free money, right? That doesn't cost anybody anything. And everybody knows the federal government has unending money. So, and they promised us they're going to pay 90% of that in the future. Uh, so, uh, we're talking about a huge increase in state spending, even now and going forward. Minnesota Care, they had to appropriate $406 million additional for the next biennium to meet its enrollment. This is the Commissioner of Commerce in Minnesota, Michael Rothman. Um, he and I are not close friends. Um, last week at a press conference, uh, he announced the premium increases of Minnesota. You may have seen the news. I was at the press conference. Uh, President Obama, last, early last year, realized this was a political landmine. Because open enrollment is supposed to start October 1st. It's already supposed to be going. But if you open enrollment on October 1st, then everybody in the country is going to know about the new premiums, and they're going to be really angry. And if they're really angry, they're not going to vote for Democrats, they're going to vote for Republicans. So Mr. Obama said open enrollment will start our, uh, November 15th. Mm -hmm. Oh, like that's right after the election, isn't it? <laughs> but governors had the ability to release those rates early, and thank goodness, the governor did this in Minnesota. He got so much heat that he finally said, we're going to release the rates on October 1st. So at the press conference on October 1st, Mr. Rothman made this announcement that once again, we had the lowest rates in the nation. Last year, we had the lowest rates in the nation. That was a company called Preferred One. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. Hold on to your seats. You are not going to believe what you hear. So once again, we have the lowest rates in the nation. What does that mean? That means our rates are, are higher than they should be, but they're not as high as they are in South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and everywhere else. They could be worse. We should be thankful for that. He said there was an average 4.5% rate increase. He was very, very proud of that. Now, it's very important that we unpack what that means. There are five health plans that are going to sell in the Twin Cities. The 4.5%, first of all, only re related to the Twin Cities. It did not relate to rates anywhere else in the state, okay? That's the first thing you have to know. New care went down 9%. That's why the average got skewed down. Guess what? Last year, new care was 25 to 30% higher than everybody else. So they went down 9%, which means this year they're not going to be higher than everybody else. They're just going to be as high as everybody else. Uh, Average them with the other plans that came up with this 4.5%. You care had 600 enrollees in Venture last year. Preferred one had over 30,000. And uh, Blue Cross, I've seen different numbers. I saw 13,000. I saw somewhere near 10,000. I don't know what the number is. Uh, Medica had people, uh, health partners did in the individual market. So Preferred one is the big one here now. This is what happened. We got their rates this week, folks, and I kid you not, their rates have gone up 40 to 60 percent or more. Some of you may have preferred one health plans right now, and you're nervous. <laughs> this is an example. It's over on the table over there. It shows four bronze plans, preferred one, Blue Cross, Health Partners, and Medica in 2014 and 2015. On those four bronze plans, pretty much identical plans, preferred one, uh, preferred one went up 66%. They are not selling in Venture this year. <laughs> uh, last year, they were the lowest rates in the nation. This year, they're charging what they probably should have charged last year. Um, and so, 
that 4.5% really doesn't mean much when you realize that the, the company that enrolled more people in Venture than anybody else had this huge rate increase. Uh, Blue Cross went up 17%. In this uh, particular example, it's 15.33. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. They're trying to recap, recapture their costs. So, well, in the real world, we have this going on. My name is Heather. My um, insurance premium will be increasing by about 15 cents per month. I live paycheck to paycheck. I am a single mom. I help my daughter who's in college. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to stop helping her financially so that I can keep my health insurance. See, the thing is, this affects real people in real ways. Uh, this isn't theoretical. It's really what happens to people every day in their lifetime. Heather is a um, you know, quality long-term employee of a, a health insurance agency, actually, but she gets hit just like everybody else. What is she going to do? How is she going to put her daughter through uh, school? What we need to be doing, and uh, here is where, you know, people say, well, all you do is complain and rant and rave. I've got a book called 25 Keys to Healthcare Redesign. I've done a lot of thinking about this. Dr. Grisco has. Doctors do a lot of thinking about what they could do better. Believe me, there's a lot of stuff out there on ways to reform the system. But it all starts right here. To do all we can to make the patient-physician relationship first, foremost, and final. First, foremost, and final. I am on Medicare, but I go to a cash practice primary care physician, an internist, who is an exceptional doctor. I pay out of my own pocket. When I walk in, I know that it's going to cost me 60 bucks for 10 minutes. And if I sit there and talk for another 10 minutes, it's going to cost me $120. I know exactly what I'm going to pay for my physical and my laboratory work. Sometimes a doctor and I talk too long, and then when he charges me more, I say, wait a minute, most of that was about politics. But uh, <laughs> he is a dear friend of mine. Uh, I was telling him. Uh, physician here earlier on Christmas Eve 2012 I was on my treadmill and something went wrong with my head and uh, I folded up my treadmill had the worst headache I had ever had in my life I don't get headaches and I called uh, Dr. Gehrig on his cell phone because I have his cell phone no matter where he is and he knows me so well that he knew immediately that I was suffering a brain bleed and he said, is your wife there? And I said, yes. He said, you tell her to take you to the nearest emergency room right now. Don't wait. So having that kind of relationship with my doctor, very important. When he came to see me in the hospital, I said, you saved my life. God bless you. What an incredible thing. That's the way we're supposed to do medicine. When he sits across the desk from me, he's not typing on a computer. He's not keeping electronic medical records. He's not distracted by paperwork. I tell him he's in my space. He's staring at me. He's listening to me. He's analyzing what I'm saying. He's looking carefully at my color and everything else to help me become a healthy patient. There's scores of ideas of how to do this. The question is, should Congress repeal the Affordable Care Act? What do you think? Yeah. Okay, I agree with you. And then what? And then what? The answer is that there are a lot of things that we could do. A lot of people say what we ought to do is do what Canada has done. Well, you are so blessed tonight <laughs> to have uh, in this room someone who knows a bit about that. There's an old saying, uh, you'll be the same person in five years as you are today except for two things, the people you meet and the books you read. And I would add the books you write, because that's changed my life. But several years ago, I was at uh, Barnes & Noble in Eden Prairie doing a book signing for our first book. This was 2006, the first book we did. It's called Your Health Matters uh, by Dave Racer and Greg Dutillo, my writing partner. So isn't this, this is really, I mean, this is awesome. I'm a writer, and I'm having a book signing at Barnes & Noble, and one person came. Lee Carisco. <laughs> and he'd already bought the book and read it, so I didn't even make any money that night, except we sat and talked for an hour and became close friends. And it was sometime later 
when he told me about his book, and I was able to help him put that book together and publish that book, uh, Health Reform, The End of the American Revolution, and it's an incredibly good book, and we brought it along. So, you want Canadian health care? Let me introduce you to it. <laughs> Lindsay McCreeth, a retired body shop owner from Newmarket, Ontario, began having headaches and had a seizure in January of 2006. Both he and his doctor suspected a possible brain tumor. He needed an MRI fast. How long was the wait? Four months before we could get our first MRI here in Ontario. So in their hour of desperation, the McCreeths called private medical broker Rick Baker. Bear in mind, if you have a suspected brain tumor, it's really important you find out if, in fact, you do have a brain tumor. And beyond that, it's very important to find out if it's malignant or if it's benign. They were waiting four and a half months to get this uh, an MRI. Came to us on the 2nd of February of 06. On the 3rd of February, they were down in Buffalo. They got an MRI, which indeed showed that uh, Lindsay had a brain tumor. He had a mass in his brain that was the size of a golf ball. He came back to Canada with his MRI in his hand, went to see his family doctor. He uh, was given a May the 27th uh, date to see a neurosurgeon. Now this is back on the 3rd of February. I was angry at the waiting of three months. He didn't want to wait till May the 27th, knowing he had a tumor. The surgery was scheduled for within a week's time. Lindsay McCreeth got his brain surgery in the U.S. The results of the biopsy? Cancer. If that had been a class 4 uh, astrocytoma tumor, he would not have made it. He would not have lasted eight months. He would have, in all likelihood, have died. My father passed away a few months before this happened, so we happened to have the money there. But if we hadn't, I would have put a mortgage on a home to go for the surgery across the border rather than wait six, eight months, which is ridiculous when your life is threatened. Now, I understand that there is a movement afoot in the U.S. by uh, certain, in certain circles to try and duplicate the Canadian system in the U.S., trying to adopt a single-payer system in the U.S. Then where will I send my clients? I'll have nowhere to send my clients. Your hospitals will be backed up. You people will be waiting two or three years for surgeries. I'll have nowhere to send Canadians. Hello, thank you for having me tonight. Um, this uh, type of thing is very real to me. Uh, being from Canada, it, you know, most of my... Sorry. That's okay. Uh, you know, first of all, our family lives up in Canada and hear stories like this all the time. My mother-in-law is having a health issue, can't get the care that she needs. And I do what I can to try to facilitate things, um, but it leaves you feeling rather powerless. So it, it's not just an abstraction to me, it's a it's a day-to-day -day real thing. Um, I used to be a true believer in Canadian health care, um, actually for most of my life, until about the age of 41. Um, I really believe that it was the government's job to make sure that people had access to health care. When I was a kid, I was brought to the government uh, clinic and there was no direct exchange of dollars between us and the doctor and the health care just magically appeared. But then, um, and, and in fact, actually, I remember um, uh, prior to medical school having a conversation with an American urologist and uh, he was saying that, you know, in Canada we do things all wrong, it's absolutely crazy that, you know, you need to have a free market in health care. Being from Canada and indoctrinated in that line of thinking, I thought the guy was crazy. And you know, I tried to argue, you know, why I thought government healthcare was the right way to go. But it, um, it was just something that I had sort of absorbed through my pores, but I hadn't thought of rationally. Well, fast forwarding many years, um, uh, about the age of 38, long after finishing all my medical training and having worked as a family doctor for a while and being trained as a radiologist. I found myself in the circumstance where I was the medical director of diagnostic imaging for Thunder Bay Regional Hospital in Thunder Bay, Canada. It was a large, pretty large hospital, about 300 beds, and we had a catchment area of about 250,000 people. And I was suddenly confronted with the reality of actually delivering healthcare in a system like that. And I saw the reality of trying to do things efficiently and get, uh, tests, get tests done in a timely manner and so on. And um, it was right about that time I read a book called Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it, maybe you've read it. 
But it was almost uh, kind of a, almost a divine intervention that I happened to read that book at that time in my life. I had been thinking about reading it for a few years and never got around it. And finally I said, well, you know, maybe I should start reading this book. And um, uh, if you're not familiar, the basic storyline is, you know, what would happen in the United States with the institution of socialism. And the main characters were these various industrialists that were trying to bring their various goods and services to the market. But every which way they turn, the government would be in the way impeding their ability to go do so. Meanwhile, uh, I ended up as director of diagnostic imaging in Federal Canada, and I was trying to deliver time and care, and uh, had a number of ideas on how to do so, uh, and improve service, and every which way I turned, the government was in the way, impeding my ability to do what I wanted to do and what really needed to be done. And uh, finally, I put the connection together between what was happening in my real life and what was happening in this story, and I realized that uh, socialism not only does not work, it's actually immoral because it's predicated upon a loss of individual freedom. So, you know, I came to the conclusion that I had to move to the United States where it was a relatively freer market and I could practice higher quality medicine. Um, the cover of my book, hopefully the symbolism is obvious with the mighty American eagle with a stethoscope around its neck and yet chained down to the American capital. And health reform the end of the American Revolution. You know, America was founded on the idea of individual freedom and liberty. And when we get to the point where the American people are comfortable with the idea of having the government tell them what type, quality, and amount of health care they're allowed to have, the basic essence of the American Revolution will become the lost. But I did pose it as a question because we really don't know how it's ultimately going to end up. Um, <coughs> this is a quote from one of my favorite authors. <coughs> Uh, the first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of everything for all of those that want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. <laughs> and nothing could be more true in the setting of health care. It seems Mark Twain actually knew about uh, Obamacare uh, back in his day, with uh, it despite being called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. People are losing their insurance, uh, costs are going up, uh, there's a website that costs $2 billion that doesn't actually work, um, and then we had to pass the bill to find out that was actually what was in the bill. And he said, it's no wonder that truth is stranger than fiction, fiction has to make sense. Another nice theme in my talk and in my book is that man is not free unless government is limited by one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan. There's a lot of myths about government health care. Uh, I'll dispense with this first one very quickly. Health care is not a right. The politicians won't tell you that. Even Mitt Romney will, will tell you that it is a right. It's not a right. The basic concept of a right is it's a moral sanction on free action. You have a right to do whatever you like so long as you don't harm anybody in the process or imposing your obligations on them. If you're going to say health care is a right, you're, big, you're implicitly saying somebody must uh, dispense with their labor and money to serve you. And so it basically negates the whole concept of rights in its original form. Um, you know, health, health, government health care does not work. We're going to talk about that more. We're going to talk about how outcomes can be misleading in the argument for a government health care system versus free market. And how would a free society deal with poor people without the huge apparatus of government? If by any chance you happen to believe that the Canadian health care system is a functional system, I hope we could disabuse you of that right now. <coughs> The Fraser Institute, uh, based in British Columbia, Canada, does a yearly survey figuring out how long people are waiting. Um, and I check it, it fluctuates a little bit, but the last time I checked it was 17.7 weeks average to see a specialist in Canada. Uh, you can only see a specialist in Canada with a family doctor referral. Um, you cannot just pick up the phone and call them. Uh, and 16% of Canadians have no access to primary care to get those referrals. And so what that means is a huge portion of the Canadian population that has chronic medical problems, high blood pressure, you know, chronic lung disease, heart disease, or whatever, the problems are simply not addressed until they're at a crisis stage and basically, uh, you know, go to the emergency department, deal with it in a crisis mode. Um, it varies from region to region, despite being a so-called so egalitarian system. It varies largely from region to region as far as the access to health care. 40% uh, was their... Uh, 
figure to use when I was working in Canada as far as people that did not have access to primary care. It's probably about the same now. Uh, two year waiting lists are not uncommon. I knew a gastroenterologist was two years to get to see him. I knew an upper extremity orthopedic surgeon, two years to see her. Uh, back surgeon, back surgeon, I knew it was about two years to see him. Our wait time when I was working up in Thunder Bay for an MRI scan was 13 months. And imagine the gray hair that I got trying to triage these, figuring out who needed to be seen more quickly. And oftentimes, this history would be just one light long, back pain, okay, back pain's a common problem, usually doesn't have a serious origin. And I would put them in a line, read their scan several months later, and realize that they had a tumor there, or an infection, a rampant infection that should have been dealt with months earlier. Our wait time for CT scan was seven months. In the province of Newfoundland, the waiting time for an MRI has been as high as 2.5 years. And where I grew up in, Thunder, in Sault Ste. Marie, and we still own property, uh, if you're new to the community, it's generally about five years to get into a family doctor. Unless you happen to have connections in the medical system where you can get in sooner. Some communities run lotteries if a new doctor comes to town as the new gets to see them. And totally consistent with government mediocrity, the benchmarks Orange benchmarks are at 70% of the time and 30% of the provinces. This is an image from uh, the Globe and Mail, which is sort of Canada's equivalent of the New York Times from about two years ago. A new family doctor's office that opened up in Barhaven, which is a, is a uh, suburb of Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Um, and people literally queuing up to get registered in this family doctor's office. And the author of this article, in this, the story title is, The Soul is Right Search for a Doctor. And along the bottom it says, there, was just, there were just as many people behind me, Gloria Gallery says, of the lineup for a family doctor. And we're not talking about Taktayakta on the article in short here. We're talking a suburb of the capital of Canada where people can't access health care. This is just out of the Canadian news, just within the last month. Um, an article about ER wait times. The sort of accepted number by the government is a three hour wait to be seen by a physician and nurse department. But 60% of the hospitals that they surveyed are not meeting that benchmark. In fact, um, they give the example of Grace Hospital in Winnipeg, where I did my radiology training. Well, I didn't do it at that hospital, but it's in Winnipeg where I did my radiology training. The average wait time is nine hours to see a physician. This, when I, um, before I did radiology, I worked as a family doctor and did a lot of work in the ER as well. And it was a common everyday occurrence because we didn't have enough hospital beds to admit people to the hallway. <coughs> um, and it was very stressful because, you know, if you put these people in the hallway, uh, there'd be people coming and going, the lights would be on, and these people are sick. Well, this poor fellow got delegated into a supply room and he passed away uh, with nobody knowing about it. Um, so anyways, it's kind of a black eye on the government system uh, in Quebec. Tim Hortons, you may know about Tim Hortons. They recently bottled Burger King. Um, they are an iconic business in Canada. There's a Tim Hortons almost in any street corner in Canada. Now, this is to remind me of a story to tell you about my brother, who about 10 years ago, um, he started to get some headaches. He wasn't feeling well. And he went on an airline flight, and you know when you get that stuff up feeling your ear and your land, and usually it passes a few minutes after your land. Well, it never cleared on him. So he ended up seeing an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and, um, and he put a tube in his ear, and I thought, well, boy, that's really odd. Um, you know, it's kind of classic in the neuroradiology textbooks that if you have an effusion in, your, in an adult, that's a, that's a red flag for nasopharyngeal cancer. And I figured, well, I saw an ENT doctor. I'm sure he inspected the nasal pharynx, which is a space sort of behind your nasal cavity. <coughs> and I assumed that it all been checked out. Well, anyways, he got sicker and sicker, headaches, big lymph nodes in his neck, losing weight. Um, and this is a guy that is not a complainer. He is not a complainer. Well, ultimately, Christmas Day, this would be about 10 years ago, he just couldn't take any more. Um, he, he just could not get the imaging. I've been saying to him, you need to get an MRI of your head and neck. Couldn't get it. Basically, on Christmas Day, when these kids were actually small, I thought it was a big deal for him to go to the hospital Christmas morning. And he went to the hospital, and um, they uh, they wouldn't. It was Christmas Day. They wouldn't do an MRI. They wouldn't do any diagnostic testing. 
And so anyways, it happened to be that my parents were visiting, my dad's a retired judge, this very certain person, he just basically raised the roof and said, you will do imaging on this, I don't care that the, you know, that the uh, apartment is closed. So they made a concession, they, it's the end of on Boxing Day, which is still a hospital, but it was just the day after Christmas in Canada, it's still a holiday. They made a concession, they scanned them, and then the scan was read, and they said um, that this is sinusitis, and I got the word back. I had a suspicion, a suspicion all along that my brother actually had this experience of cancer. And uh, one of my family members contacted me and said, oh yeah, he's got sinusitis. Well, it didn't make sense for the system. So I got on the plane, I made a special concession for work to get on the plane. I went and got on the plane, flew to Toronto. Uh, my sister got a copy of the MRI scan. I held it up to the light on the desk, and I said, my brother, Blake, has nasal pharyngeal cancer. And it's very, very advanced. Um, I can tell the doctor caring for him, my brother has nasal pharyngeal cancer. I can tell my brother he has nasal pharyngeal cancer. And so the internist caring for him tried to arrange for emergency uh, you know, treatment, which he didn't get for six weeks. Now, fortunately, my brother survived it. It's, it can be, even when advanced, it can be quite treatable. And you know, he's got a lot of morbidities, but he survived it. But he probably wouldn't have had those morbidities if he had the diagnosis in Europe previously. Now, what does Tim Hortons have to do with that? My brother's in a Canadian hospital attempting to get health care. He couldn't get the health care that he needed while he was in a Canadian hospital. But Tim Hortons had a kiosk down in the lobby. And when I was visiting him, I could get a sandwich, nice sandwich and a coffee and a donut or whatever any time of the night or day, 24 7, in a Canadian hospital. So it doesn't make, it's lost upon the Canadian people that you can get a coffee and a donut and a sandwich in a Canadian hospital 24 7 at a reasonable price. But you can't get the health care you need in a Canadian hospital. Why? Because of the contrast between health care being delivered under a socialist government model versus the free market. And it's just a concept. Health care is not different. You know, economic supplies to everything. Uh, whether you want to insist that health care is different, it's not. Um, the outcome thing is a false argument. Michael Moore likes to say, well, Canadians live two years longer than Americans, you know. Well, it's true, but, but there's more to longevity than just um, the healthcare system. I mean, it has a lot to do with your racial makeup, your personal habits, and so on and so forth. And traditionally, the Canadian population is a more homogeneous uh, racial mix. Typically, more you know, Caucasian, um, with fewer minority groups, although that's changing. Um, and whereas the United States is more diverse population with a wider array of racial mixes, and it's just a fact that regardless of, well, even when you correct for social and economic differences, black people don't live as long. And with, you know, 13 or 50% of the American population black, it pulls the average down. And I'm not passing blame or anything, it's just the way it is. Um, on the other hand, Asians tend to live the longest. So you're really making a comparison between two different populations. It's an apples and oranges type of thing. Now, one, one point is Americans say, oh, we spend way too much money on health care. Well, I agree with that to a point. On the other hand, not all healthcare spending is bad. As a radiologist, you know, much of what I do is I provide information. I don't necessarily radically outcome or make an outcome difference on how long someone's going to live. But I'll give you an example. I fell off the roof uh, 10 years ago. I crushed uh, a foot in a bone in my midfoot. And um, it was actually the worst navicular fracture in the Twin Cities that the home treated surgeons have ever seen. And well, anyways, I got a CAT scan promptly, and, and it was really helpful because they looked at, you know, they said, this is just too fragmented, if you put screws in there or whatever, it's just going to crumble. And so they realized that surgery was contraindicated, and the CAT scan was very HML. That's information. And so I never got surgery, I've had a reasonable outcome from that. Um, but that was information that won't affect how long I'll live, but it was useful for me to know, and it, and it helped guide management. Um, uh, you know, around the same time, actually, I actually started having pain. I was working, I was working one day, and I had pain in my flank. I got a CAT scan within literally minutes, proving that I had a kidney stone. And that CAT scan didn't save my life, but it provided useful information, because it showed this stone is too big, it's not going to pass through the ureter spontaneously, you know, you need to have intervention to deal with it. Um, it didn't lengthen my life, but it shortened the period that I had pain and suffering. And people really want to have information. You know, my father is elderly and he's got a neurodegenerative condition and it took him a while to get a final diagnosis. And he knew that regardless of what the final diagnosis is, it's, there's likely not be much you can do about it. But people want to know. They want to know what's going on. And I think that needs to be respected. 
So when you just when you just look at these old measures like outcomes, you can see interestingly, Hispanic women in the United States without insurance have better uh, infant mortality than the insured population. I have no idea why, but it's just the way it is. So it's misleading. And as you know, the World Health Organization says our health care is terrible here. They rank as 37th in the world between, I think, Slovenia and Costa Rica. Um, but if you actually read an analysis of that report, they're, gauged, they're grading this on the basis to which it is government controlled and government financed. Um, if when you look at the report, the, the access to physicians and the quality of actual medical care is number one. But the biased media never mentions that. Central planning does not work. This is key to uh, why government health care will never work. <clears throat> about, I guess at this point, probably about 20 years ago, health care costs in Canada were just going up and up and up. And so the federal government wanted to figure out, well, how do we control health care costs in Canada? So they, um, they had a committee look into this, and the conclusion of this uh, commission, actually, was that to control health care costs in Canada, they need to, to reduce the number of doctors. Um, and because doctors are kind of a rate limiting step in delivering health care. So they cut back on the number of physician training <coughs> positions. Um, and it, they kind of overshot the mark because now um, there's huge shortages of physicians in Canada. Uh, there just aren't enough to go around to service everybody. Now that really hit home for me, first of all, there was so few people getting med school, I thought this was the blessings that I even got in. But anyways, um, uh, when I was working up in Canada, we worked in an area that the Ministry of Health said needed 13 people to not be underserviced. When I joined the group, there was eight of us. Long story, there was a personnel meltdown, people couldn't get along um, because of a forced amalgamation of two groups imposed by the government, which goes against the whole concept of freedom of association, but nonetheless, there was a personnel meltdown, we ended up with three people delivering service to 250,000 people. And the American College of Radiology says there should be about one radiologist for every 13,000 people. So do the math. I mean, we were being crushed with work. So I said to the hospital, uh, I said to the CEO, you know, we are really busy here. We're really trying to give timely service. And at that time, we were successful in actually getting the reports out in 24 hours. Uh, now it's not uncommon for them to wait six months to get the report even after the scan is done. So I said, you know, we've got a lot of these just plain x-rays. Um, at that time, we weren't doing things on computers. I said to the hospital, you need to purchase a roloscope for us so that we can just load, have a clerk load these films onto the roloscope, and we can just push a button and just learn through these simple, shorter cases to help get our work done. We said, well, you know, we've used up our budget because the hospital is offering out of a budget, not out of profit. We've used up our budget. There's no money. Maybe you can plead your case to the Ministry of Health. 700 miles away, and they give you a special dispensation of funds for this roloscope. Anyways, three years later, they got their roloscope. I had given up the frustration I was down here. They finally got their roloscope, and then it collected cobwebs for uh, uh, another year because uh, there was no money to budget for clerk load films. <laughs> Meanwhile, I moved here, and we're getting busier and busier, and I was working at St. Francis Regional Medical Center, and um, uh, you know, our volumes were going up, we had to be kind of the cell tail and so on. So I said to my partner and I said to our radiology group, we need to get a roll scope so we can read these films and give time to service and be competitive, etc. Well, we got the roll scope within a month. And the reason is, is because in the United States there's a message of a free market where um, uh, there's a message to use capital wisely to be more productive. Unlike the social system, where the capital is distributed just by arbitrary decree by central planners. The fatal conceit is a term coined by Friedrich Hayek, who is referring to the fact that government planners think that they're smart enough to run complex systems, and they're not. They're not smart enough to grasp the fact that the things they're trying to run are far more complex than any one mind or any one small group of minds can actually control. Complex systems need to be run spontaneously by the decisions of individuals making individual personal decisions in the free market. Now, despite the fact that central planning absolutely does not work, these are different forms of central planning uh, that have been uh, talked about and used, uh, both at the federal level and the state level, um, you know, electronic medical records, preventive care, managed care, diocese of care, resource management. They're all just feel-good terms for central planning. 
And the mother of all central planning is the accountable care organizations. And this is the thing that most people probably don't know about. The idea is, is let's say you get pancreatic cancer. So you end up at the Mayo Clinic, a parcel of money goes with you for you to be treated for your pancreatic cancer. Everybody involved at the Mayo Clinic has to fight it out for their piece of the pot. So it becomes very divisive within the medical community. Uh, meanwhile, the, the government allows them to have some of their financial remuneration from the savings that they, in other words, there's a conflict of interest to spend less money, less money on the patient rather than serve the patient's interest. And you know, the problem there is they want physicians and hospitals to hold the underwriting risk that should be held by the insurance company. Uh, so if centralized control doesn't work, what would work? Well, decentralized control would work. I mean, that's what gave me my iPhone. That's what, you know, that's what gives us this PowerPoint. It's, it's decisions of people working together cooperatively, exchanging cash, and uh, using the cash as information about resources allocation. And so that they can be allocated rationally and spontaneously, as opposed to just a bureaucrat making an arbitrary decision about whether or not to get out of the roll scroll. But keep it in mind, these bureaucrats are not just making decisions about my silly little example of a rolloscope. They're making a myriad of decisions and hoping that every little decision they make is going to mesh together and, and work to produce abundance in healthcare. So where should the control be? The control should be in the hands of the 318 million Americans, 850,000 doctors, 2.5 million nurses, and the nearly 6,000 hospitals. Price control controls don't work. When I was up in Canada, I used to do a procedure called an angioplasty where I would puncture the artery in the person's groin, and feed a catheter up in their arteries, and then inflate the balloons and stretch out to be narrow. And it could be remarkably helpful for people. And you know, people would present with issues with pain when they walked, uh, insufficient circulation, you know, they maybe have unclean ulcers in their feet. And um, uh, but the problem was, you know, it typically take about an hour to do the angioplasty. But the reimbursement was so low, it was only about $90. And I was the only one stupid enough to do it. The problem with the $90 reimbursement is how that money goes to the government. For $45, you're working around like a plumber inside of somebody's blood vessels, and yet you're assuming millions of dollars of potential liability risk. So it didn't make economic sense to actually do this procedure. No one else was willing to do it. And then when I was going to leave, the surgeons had a fit. Well, who were we going to refer to for angioplasties? Well, the true cost could potentially go up with these central price controls because then they have to travel to Winnipeg or have an open operation with a longer recovery time, a long hospitalization. So true costs can actually go up with the price controls. For example, my, just to put perspective, I had this issue with my snowblower a couple years ago. Just for them to physically look at my snowblower was $99. So I'm not, I'm not crying poverty. I was paid well overall, but there's just a little bit of inequity there. And the primary point is price controls don't work. There's a procedure I did called facet injections where you inject the small joints of a person's back using x-ray guidance. The pay was $14, and you have your facets on both sides of your back. Um, you can only pay for one side. And so, <laughs> so basically, you're doing a facet injection for $7. Half that money is going to tax for $3.5. They want me to put a needle strategically into your spine. We were overwhelmed with requests for this. We simply couldn't do it. We said we just can't do it. Uh, the actual result of price controls is short. The problem with health insurance is it's not really insurance in the true sense of the word. Insurance, the purpose of insurance is to reimburse you for large unexpected financial losses. A few years ago, you know, there's a big storm where some hail damage to our roof was a $30,000 repair job. Uh, the insurance kicked in. It was useful to have homeowner's insurance now. My homeowner's insurance does not pay for floor wax, you know, it doesn't pay for vacuum bags or any of those mundane things. If it did, it would be astronomically expensive. And, and, um, but it's really called homeowners insurance is quite reasonable. There's no push for government to intervene to reduce homeowners insurance. And what we're doing when we have health insurance, we're virtually everything is paid for, we're spending other people's money. And as you know, the Freedom points out, we're not very good at having stewardship for other people's money. It's just the way it is. It's the insurance company's money, it's not mine. I'm not going to shop around. I'll, I'll just get this service regardless of how expensive it is. So inexpensive insurance and inexpensive health care is the, or sorry, inexpensive. Expensive insurance, expensive health care is the law. Now, these, there's, um, in my family, there's myself, my wife, and two teenage children, and, and these guys. 
Um, Noah, the black guy, is a Newfoundland. He's about $150,000. She's a mixed breed part, uh, St. Bernard. She's about 90 pounds. They have the best insurance plan in the whole household. And the reason is because they have true insurance. Um, uh, before we had them, we had another newbie who got sick suddenly, about age five, and had um, acute leukemia. And she was dead within two weeks, and there was a lot of cost with that. So I figured, well, the next dogs, we're going to want to um, prepare for that possibility. So I bought, I booked an insurance for them. And the prices are really reasonable, you know, like $180, $190. For Noah now, he's almost uh, seven, so he, for a large, for a giant breed that's considered geriatric. I just renewed him, it was $380 for a year, which is really quite reasonable, and there was a lot of health problems. Well, about a year and a half ago, he got out, he was running around the snow, and he came home, and he was very, very lame. And I called my sister's veterinarian, and she, before I even finish the story, she said, torn and your cruciate ligament. So I brought him to the, the veterinarian, they made the diagnosis, torn and cruciate ligament, they operated on him, and um, the insurance kicked in. Now, I was out of pocket about $1,000, um, the insurance kicked in and covered like $2,000 or something like that. So overall, he had a diagnosis and treatment of an anterior cruciate ligament with a very sophisticated operation where they cut the bone, reposition, and put in a graft. It actually sounds more complex than a human uh, operation. And the prices were very reasonable. So, you know, most of the services I get from these guys, routine checkups and flea medication and whatnot, I just pay for it, okay? Because I know it's an expected quantity. I pay for it, and uh, the prices are reasonable. Now, even when he had something catastrophic happen, because they're functioning in the free market, the prices remain reasonable. And what the insurance company did is they wrote me a check that I spent in the free market. So even when the insurance kicked in, I was still a consumer and had choices. They couldn't get it with gouging people, like the big healthcare chains can do, which is utterly gouge people uh, that don't have insurance. Yeah. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. You're doing pretty good. Okay, okay. Uh, I've got a little bit of competition there. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Just before you know, there was this demand for government intervention to fix health care. The uninsured problem was exaggerated. At any given moment, there have been about 48 million people uninsured prior to Obamacare. 12 million of these people are in the country illegally, um, and they're counted as the uninsured. Now, I don't think that's reasonable. Even in Canada, if you're in the country illegally, and they don't have an illegal problem like they do here. Uh, you don't qualify for government programs. Why? Because you're in the country illegally. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, and they won't just send you a bill for any services rendered. You won't be turned down for service if you show up at the hospital, but you will be sent the bill. 14 million people qualify for government programs, but, don't, but haven't filled out the paperwork. 18 million, now these numbers are a little bit old from a few years ago, but 18 million of them all earned over $50,000 a year, 10 million earned more than $75,000 a year. And Dave Racer calculated that the true hardcore uninsured is about 8 million people. So why are we writing this monstrous legislation to deal with the real problem, which is the hardcore 8 million, hardcore uninsured of about 8 million people, usually the working poor? It's a, um, Obamacare is based on everything that has been proven to not work. Price controls on health uh, services and health insurance, central planning, third party payment, um, taking doctors to hospitals against each other, and in Massachusetts where they have mandatory insurance under Obamacare, the uh, waiting lists are skyrocketing and the costs are the highest in the country for health care. So we know Obamacare is not going to work. Well, Obamacare does not break free from the status quo, it actually reinforces it. Simple reforms would work. Very simple reforms would work. We're never going to produce a utopian world where everything is absolutely perfect, but this would improve things a lot. Health savings accounts, those should be made more, more robust where people start to transact with clinics and hospitals and purchase current uh, care as consumers, where they shop around. High deductible insurance is a good idea where it's functioning more as true insurance. Uh, we should look at the issue of purchasing insurance across state lines. The issue, Mr. Racer knows a lot about this. All the mandates, you know, uh, get in the way of purchasing health care insurance across state lines. That needs to be looked at. The tax code needs to be looked at. It doesn't make sense that the employer gets the deduction for health insurance, but if you buy it as an individual, you don't. And the consequence of that is you lose your job, you lose your insurance. We need to look at deregulation. Just Medicare regulations alone, there's over 100,000 pages of Medicare regulations. 
and tort reform. I mean, that's one thing Canada has actually done right, is that you can only um, sue for $250,000 of uh, pain and suffering damages. You can sue for unlimited damages, like for example, if the hospital removes the wrong leg or something, you can't work again, I mean, that makes sense that you can compensate it for economic losses, but there's a, a cap on pain and suffering. And they don't have the out of control losses that you hear. So my point is, rather than blowing the whole system up with a tank, just tweak the system a little bit with a screwdriver and we could get things working a lot better. I'm sure you've heard of healthcare.gov, the frustrations people had, $2 million spent on this website that doesn't work. Again, frustration. Now this is Medibit. Medibit uh, is uh, an organization, it's a company that I've been involved with for about four years now. And the concept is, it's an online interactive portal for buying and selling medical goods and services. Um, uh, both myself and my friend Ralph Weber, who started this, also came and living in the United States, realized that the fundamental problem is we don't have a true free market in healthcare. And uh, Medicare is the marketplace for medicine. So say you need a knee replacement, you don't have insurance. You go on there, it's, you know, basically say, I need a knee replacement. Anybody, that, any physician that does that can submit a bid. You see all the bids. You look at the doctor's credentials. The, you, know, you read about what they special, about how they do it, etc. And you make it, so it's not like a true auction. You get to pick what you want. And the interesting thing you find is that people don't necessarily pick the cheapest um, uh, bid. They, they pick, um, they often make choices based on something else that they like about the physician. And so it's not necessarily the cheapest, but overall the prices that we get are, are really low. You know, a hip replacement typically may be, you know, if you went to Mayo, they're going to quote prices of like $60,000. We get things like that for like $14,000. Now, interestingly, um, we had a lot of press about many bid, like the Good Morning America, and the Today Show, and Reuters, the American Press. We had this flurry of, free, uh, you know, uh, publicity. Well, this was right around the time of the big healthcare.gov debit code, and our website hits went from about 150 to about 10, 15,000 a day, and our website worked, and it didn't cost two billion dollars. This is my friend, Dr. Lita Ack. She lives in New Jersey. She's running for the 12th district for the U.S. Uh, uh, House of Representatives. And she, she's a physician. She and her husband were um, uh, struggling. They had a clinic and they were seeing Medicaid patients. And you know they were going broke seeing these Medicaid patients because it wouldn't cover the costs. So they said, well, we're not going to see Medicaid patients, but we're going to open up a clinic in the church basement. And they did so. And the church you know, let them do so. They opened up a, a free clinic in the church basement. No government money whatsoever. They got volunteers to man the front desk, volunteer nurses, volunteer doctors. They get free drug, drug samples and so on. And um, they made it work. Now, if you go in her community, if you go to the emergency department as a Medicaid patient, the average visit is something like $13,000. If you go to the federally, federally qualified health clinic, it, the cost is approximately about $650. If you go to their clinic in the church, well actually they've, they've got a new building now, but um, $13 for the average visit, all covered through private donations. The point is private charity can work if we let it work. People want to help. They have to turn people away from this clinic that want to help out at this clinic. You know, we don't need a huge apparatus of government to take care of the poor. The Canada Health Act enacted, enacted in 1984 it basically codified the government system of healthcare, individual provinces have been experimenting it for years. Um, it was 13 pages long and destroyed healthcare in Canada. 13 pages. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is about 2,500 pages long, so 2,000 times the degree of complexity. Um, just imagine what the devastation is going to be, how unworkable it's going to be. There's 159 new bureaucracies under Obamacare. When I worked in Canada, it was relatively streamlined. There was two bureaucracies, the OHIP, Ontario Health Insurance Plan, that paid me, and the Ministry of Health, which basically um, sort of managed resources, and who got what money for re running emergency departments, all that type of thing. That's the central planners. Two bureaucracies versus 159 new ones. Um, the CPT codes, which are used to bill, are going to go from 18,000 different codes up to 140,000 codes. And when I was in Canada, um, see, there, it's actually not truly a nationalized healthcare system because the individual provinces administer it, and many of the individual provinces break themselves down into regions. So there's a little bit more local control. But even still, it's three years to get a roll scope, and you know, so um, uh, and they're trying to manage all of the nuances of running the super complex system. The United States has ten times the population of Canada. It's ten times the population. 
And they're going to try to even more centrally control it all through Washington, D.C., as opposed to the more decentralized uh, version in Canada. It's not going to work. This is uh, Obamacare the legislation. And it's anticipated 100,000 pages of regulations from Obamacare. Now, about a year or so ago, the first 13,000 pages of regulations were written. It was calculated that compliance would require 127 million work hours to comply. That is the equivalent of building 1,040 Mount Rushmore's. The first one took 14 years. It becomes mind-boggling, and that's only the first 13,000 pages of legislation with another 87,000 expected. How is this going to make healthcare work better? How is it going to make it cheaper? Dave and I both love this slide with all the bureaucracy. It's the physician over here and the patient over here. And my understanding is 70% of the complexity has been eliminated from this slide. This is a slide I just got today. Um, it's actually from Physicians for a National Health Insurance Program. Oh, it's actually project probably. Uh, well, anyway, so what, it, what it's showing is a very much a flatline the number of physicians over the last few decades, but the number of administrators, for some reason it's not showing the slide, is actually more like this. Uh, there's a huge disconnect in the number of administrators. Again, so there's this, you know, those are all costs for administration. Well, there we go. <laughs> Richard Foster, who was the chief Medicare actuary uh, at the time the Medicare or Obamacare was passed, anticipated that uh, Obamacare would cost $222 billion over 10 years. Now keep in mind that the government's not very good at predicting costs because they said that from the perspective of uh, 1966, they said that Medicare would cost $12 billion in 1990, but it actually cost $170 billion. You know, I'm not a financial guy, but these are all the various obligations of the federal government, you know, Social Security, Medicare, these obligations just went up and up. There is no room uh, for Obamacare, no money in the ticket, uh, in the kitty for that. All healthcare, all government healthcare is coercive in nature. In the summer of 2002, there was a highly publicized death where someone presented themselves to the emergency department, I think it was in Tuac, all over here, there was no, no physician on duty. This is something Americans have a hard time wrapping their brain off. No physician on duty in the emergency department. The patient had to be transferred to another hospital, ended up dying for whatever reason. It was publicized a lot. The, the provincial minister of health declared martial laws on physicians and said, you will work when and where we tell you. And it was not uncommon. Physicians would finish a 12-hour shift, return home, and they, they'd be delivered, given a... Um, basically a subpoena saying that you will be at work at this hospital eight hours from now, 300 miles away. And if not, there's a penalty of thousands of dollars. Uh, fortunately, there is enough freedom left in Canada that the emergency physicians fought it, and it was overruled. But it was basically martial law on physicians. How can you expect to get good care from a physician that basically has the, the point of a gun at his head to serve you? The Clinton Health Security Act of 1993, the reason I'm referring to this is because I actually have some information that I don't have the equivalent information from Obamacare. Um, but that legislation uh, had the word penalty in it 111 times, fine 6, and force 83, both prohibit 47, mandatory 24, limit 231, obligation 51, require 901, etc., etc. And the Republican version apparently wasn't that much better. The point is, all government health care, there's no benevolence there, it's all about coercion. Um, interestingly, right around the time that I left Canada, there was a commission uh, appointed by the federal government under Prime Minister Jean Chrétien to look into why health care was doing so poorly in Canada. I mean, people were starting to recognize, hey, this is not working. So they had um, uh, Roy Romano, uh, retired social, former socialist premier of Saskatchewan, to do an unbiased look at health care and what could be done to make it work better. So you know, it went from community to community, community and people, you know, people could get up to the microphone and just talk about what they thought the problem is, what should be done about it, et cetera, et cetera. And this was right around the time that I was moving to the United States. I had written my submission to them, I wrote 65 pages that I submitted to the commission with ideas like we're talking about today, basically saying, you know, this health system is moral, it will never, ever work until it's more, more of a free market. 
And then I said, they were going to be having hearings in Toronto. I was I just started working here and I said, okay, I called them. I said, I want my five minutes. Sorry, we're all booked up. We, we don't have any time to listen to you. So basically, they wanted, whereas 14 year old girls would testify and say, oh yeah, Canadian healthcare is great. You know, we got to, you know, healthcare is a right. We got to have government healthcare. Um, so uh, in 1928, Herbert Hoover prophesied, you cannot extend the mastery of the government over the daily working life of the people without at the same time making the master of the people's souls and thoughts. Free speech does not live many hours after free industry and free commerce die. So um, there's ramifications beyond just healthcare. You know, when people become subservient to the state. Um, Barack Obama is in good uh, company when Fidel Castro says, we consider health reform to have been an important battle and success of Obama's government. And Vladimir Lenin said, socialized medicine is the keystone in the arch of the socialist state. Nikita Khrushchev said, the United States will eventually fly the communist flag, and the American people will hoist it themselves. Um, in all that politics, there's really only one question, and that is who decides. Is it the overarching government or is it the individual? And I suspect that most people in this room think it should be the individual whenever possible. So it's not enough that we be against Obamacare. We have to be for something. We should be for individual freedom. And how does that manifest in healthcare? We need to be for, doc we need to be for doctors that work for patients, not for insurance companies. And that means directly transacting in a free market with reasonable prices. We need to be for true insurance, which covers large unexpected financial losses. And we need to be for true charity. Barack Obama's campaign website in his first uh, election bid, uh, he stated, on healthcare reform, the American people are too often offered two extremes, government run healthcare with higher taxes or letting the insurance companies operate without rules. I would propose to you that the more meaningful dichotomy is externalized control versus individual freedom. It's very tempting to be moved by the sense of security that a move towards government healthcare gives us. But Benjamin Franklin said it best when he said, those who give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety don't deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thank you. I was talking to Lee uh, a little bit, getting ready for this, and I said, you know, we go and we do these speeches, and then we get done, and it's like, so what? So we know all this stuff. What difference does it make in my life? Well. Nobody ever thought, I, I'm sure in this room, that your health should be decided by politicians. But I'm telling you, it is. This is perhaps the most political economic system we now have. And the only way that we're going to make a change in this system is not by lobbying the people who won't listen to us, but by changing who those people are. I want you to know this, I got a call from Congressman Wall's assistant last summer. And he said, Dave, we're hearing from employers all over the district. We don't know what to do. I said, well, you already made the mistake. So they came to me, to my office, and wanted to meet with insurance agents. What do we do? What do we do about this? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got the wrong person in office. That's the problem. The same is true in our statewide elections. Sometimes we have to vote, I say, uh, I quote a former uh, candidate, for the evil of two lessers, <laughs> instead of the lesser of two evils. Uh, because the way our system is, uh, sometimes we don't really have great choices. But I don't think there's any question this time around, if you want to save America, if you don't want it to be the end of the American Revolution, and if you want to save your health, what I didn't tell you about my brain bleed was when I talked to the charge nurse three months later. And I said, uh, it was interesting learning that you're the person who has to justify all the medical care that I got, the $172,000 that you billed Medicare, for which they got paid $68,000, but that's another story. And I said, uh, you told me that you had to justify this. And you hinted that maybe that isn't uh, an easy thing to do. And I said, tell me about this. She said, well, David, Listen to this, this is so chilling. You are 65 years old, I'm 67 now, thank God. Uh, 65 years old, you're healthy, you've never had a problem in your life. We thought it was a good investment. And I tell you, that is chilling. 
because I thought when I went in that hospital, it had to do with doing everything they could to make my pain and suffering less and extend my life as reasonably uh, long as possible. Not the fact that I was this age or I had this history before. Uh, and I don't want to give that control to someone else. So we've got to elect different people. We just have to elect different people. Some of the people we have there are pretty different already. I understand that. But uh, we've got to elect different people. The other thing we need to do is get educated. Uh, he mentioned Ralph Weber. Uh, I was also privileged to introduce Ralph and, and Dr. Crisco, and I also helped Ralph write his book. And it's over there. It's called Medicrats. Uh, I hope that you'll stop by and take a look at some of the things that we brought along tonight. We have several books that deal with health care. We have several books that deal with issues like the uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, there's a wonderful treatise on uh, Roe v. Wade, if you're into that, uh, understanding common law. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of things over there. We're going to be around and talk about that a little bit, or we'll be around for you, okay? okay. Uh, Jim. All right, let's give Dave a reading. Thank you.